On Mother's Day of 2021, in a peaceful suburb of Jackson, Florida, a young woman vanished from her home overnight. With distraught parents and a frantic community, officers and volunteers alike gathered to search for the now missing Tristan Bailey. But what they would come to find would be just as shocking as unbelievable. Welcome back to Coffeehouse Crime. My name is Adrian, and today we're talking about the case of Tristan Bailey and Aiden Fucci. If you're a parent, this case may deeply concern you. There is only so much we can do to keep our children safe from trouble. And all the same, this case confirms our greatest fears. By the way, I post solved, unsolved and strange cases here on a weekly basis, so if that sounds like your kind of thing, please consider subscribing to Coffeehouse Crime. So with that said, pull up a seat, grab a coffee and sit back. This is the case of Tristan Bailey. Today's story takes us down to South Florida. Naming the obvious, the Sunshine State is famous for its oranges, beautiful weather, and variety of theme parks. But for now, we're avoiding the tourist city of Orlando, and instead flying over to Florida's northern city of Jacksonville. With a city center population of 1 million residents alone, Jacksonville is the state's largest by population. It's a rich city with many large-scale companies calling it home, as well as a busy port serving both military and civilian needs both of which bring plenty of jobs, opportunity, and income to the area. People choose Jacksonville for its abundance of leisure and lifestyle options, and the city boasts the largest urban park system in the US, allowing people to take part in activities from boating and fishing, to surfing and water skiing. And after spending time in the sun, it's easy to relax in the laid-back atmosphere of Jax's many eateries and craft breweries. It is no wonder why people wish to settle here in Jacksonville. And our case today takes us south of the city to St. John's, an affluent suburb popular with families and veterans looking for a chilled out lifestyle. And here we find the home and family of 13 year old Tristan Bailey. Tristan was born on the 18th of January 2008 to her mother Stacy and father Forrest. She was the newest and final addition to the family, the youngest of five siblings. And the family of seven lived in a large house on Cloister Bain Drive a cul-de-sac with perfectly manicured gardens, and red-flagged mailboxes at the end of every driveway. A middle-class suburb where, arguably, not much goes wrong. The family were tight-knit, and would affectionately refer to themselves as the Bailey Seven. It's from Tristan's loving home that she attended the local school, Patriots Oaks Academy, where she studied, socialised and enrolled into the school's cheerleading squad. Tristan was extremely passionate about cheerleading, attending practices on the regular, and maybe a little too much, as apparently it sometimes got in the way of her studies. Loved by many, Tristan was a sociable and outgoing young girl with the real zest for life. She was determined to be the best at everything she did, and she was well liked amongst her peers. She also loved to go to any events she could find in her local area, as naturally she wanted to be involved with the community. And on the first weekend of May 2021, this was no different. She wanted to go to a food truck event with a friend, and after asking her mum for permission, she was allowed if her friend's parents picked them up. This came and passed by as intended, and besides meeting a few new faces, the event was rather uneventful. Tristan then returned home and went to bed, thus concluding a Friday night. The next day played out like any other Saturday, all members of the family going about their usual weekend routines, with half of the family also visiting the older sibling's house for dinner. They returned home just before midnight, where Tristan's sister walked in on her having a video call with a stranger. She didn't recognise him, but it was a boy wearing a white baseball cap. She didn't know who this boy was, but this wasn't out of the ordinary for Tristan. She was a very sociable girl. She shut the door quietly behind herself, letting her sister Tristan carry on with her call. And with that said, the family turned down for the night, everyone returning to their faithful beds akin to every usual Saturday. That was, until the next morning. As 10am arrived, the family began their Sunday rituals. And being May the 9th, it was Mother's Day in the US. Everyone headed downstairs to wish their mother a happy Mother's Day. That is, everyone except Tristan. She was nowhere to be found. Both Forrest and Stacy found this strange. Tristan was usually one of the first to rise in the mornings. But maybe she had a late night on her phone. Or perhaps maybe she was having a lazy morning. They checked her room, but there were no signs of Tristan, and after checking the rest of the house to no avail, they called her cell phone. There was no answer. 
The family began to worry, obviously they knew their daughter very well, and this was extremely out of character for her. Whenever she had plans, she would tell her mother and father, and never just disappeared. With that said, the family knew something was deeply wrong. They wasted no time to inform the police. So at 10am on Mother's Day of 2021, the Bailey household called police to report their 13-year-old daughter, Tristan, as missing. From the outset, police were concerned over the circumstances of Tristan's disappearance. And of course, Stacy obliged to give all information that she had. To Stacy and Forrest's knowledge, Tristan had never snuck out before. She was last seen by a sister at midnight, and was supposed to be in her bedroom. So, where could she have gone? Police sprang into action in their investigation, getting in contact with Tristan's friends, speaking to neighbours, and requesting surveillance footage from the local area. And eventually, they got a lead. As it turns out, according to Tristan's friend, Tristan had been speaking to a boy named Doffus Absher III, also known as Trey for short. Trey was quickly identified as a key part to the investigation, and after speaking to the 14-year-old boy, they concluded that Tristan left her home on Cloister Bain Drive and walked over to Trey's house on Telford Drive. This was a planned operation by the teens, Tristan approaching his home from the back to avoid setting off any surveillance cameras at the front of his property. It's at Trey's house that Tristan met up with another 14-year-old boy who went by the name of Aiden Fucci. The three teens stayed at Trey's house for around half an hour, and in that time, Aiden had some marijuana to chill out. Trey also told officers that around 1am that night, Tristan and Aiden left together, and that was the last time he saw or heard from Tristan. It appeared that Trey was giving officers a genuine account of the night's events, and as a result, Trey was not considered to be a suspect in the investigation. But Aiden, on the other hand, was a different story. Without any further delay, police made their way to Aiden's family home on Castledale Court, but despite this, he didn't seem phased by all of the officers around him. In fact, he went as far to pose for a Snapchat video in the back of a police car, and even joked about Tristan's disappearance. We're, we're having fun in a f***ing cop car. Yep. Tristan. What's up, guys? Yep. Tristan, if you f***ing walk out the damn... When you see this in a month... Look at this in a f***ing cop car, guys. Tripping, dude. Upon questioning the teen, police were greeted by Aiden's mother, Crystal Smith. Crystal remained present throughout Aiden's questioning and he would often turn to his mother for confirmation or support before he answered anything. Aiden confirmed that he and Tristan had left Trey's house on Telford Drive, before turning onto North Durban Parkway, which connected the three teenagers' houses. The two wandered along that road, and after getting to Cloister Bain Drive, the two parted ways shortly after 1am. So, according to Aiden, his walk home took two full hours. Which was odd, as he only lived one and a half miles away from Trey, along a straight road a walk that should have taken him half an hour at best. So, where did the other 90 minutes go? Deputy Maloney noticed this immediately, and after asking Aiden to clarify his timeline once again, he came up with an entirely different story. This time, Aiden said that he and Tristan walked further up North Durban Parkway, where along the way, Tristan apparently made an advance on Aiden, which he refused, and as a result, an altercation between the two began. During this argument, Aiden claimed that he then pushed Tristan away, resulting in her falling to the ground and hitting her head on the roadside pavement. And supposedly, he then left Tristan there on the cold sidewalk and took a walk by himself after the incident, returning home, as he said, at around 3.15am. Hmm. Aiden then told police officers that Tristan was planning to meet up with a 22-year-old drug dealer that she was talking to on Snapchat, who went by the name of Carlo. Carlo was eventually tracked down and questioned by authorities, and ultimately it was confirmed that he'd never met Tristan that night. He had a rock-solid alibi. So, Aiden was caught lying in a statement twice, and with him being the last person to see Tristan before she disappeared, the spotlight was drawing closer towards him. However, it was the evidence found in the following hours which would fully illuminate the situation, and unfortunately, shine a light over the neighbourhood's dark story. As the news of Tristan's disappearance spread throughout the community, phone calls from tipsters and neighbours alike began to flood local authorities, some of which led to nothing significant, where others would prove to be invaluable. One substantial piece of information handed in to authorities was surveillance footage from a home surveillance system on Saddlestone Drive, located one road adjacent to Aidan's family property. In the early morning hours of the night Tristan disappeared, the surveillance footage captured two individuals, thought to be Aidan and Tristan, walking eastward together. With this camera further up the road from Tristan's home, 
It was evident that Aiden had lied about leaving Tristan earlier in his journey. One and a half hours later, a single figure is seen running back in the opposite direction, with white sneakers in hand. Police had already obtained surveillance footage from multiple cameras found in Aiden's family home. And at 3.31am, the hooded figure seen on Saddlestone Drive was also spotted walking barefoot through the front door. And he was still holding the white shoes as seen on earlier surveillance footage. The discovery was substantial evidence for St. John's police, as this gave them clear direction to look for Tristan. And so, the search was widened, with the surrounding community getting involved to help find her. Sadly, neither the police or search party team would find Tristan. And instead, at 6pm on Mother's Day, local police received a sad and harrowing call. While out on a jog around the local ponds, a man had found the body of a young girl. And that body was identified to be Tristan Bailey. She had been left lying in the grass, only moments away from Saddlestone Drive where she was captured by the surveillance footage. Tragically, Tristan's body was found with 114 stab wounds across her entire body, 49 of which were located over her hands and arms, cold evidence that Tristan had desperately tried to resist her attacker. Upon further investigation of the area, she was found alongside her cell phone, which had been left inactive since she last used it for a video call at 12am, and found in the middle of the pond just 100 feet away, a folding army knife was retrieved. The knife's tip was snapped off, which was later found to be lodged in Tristan's skull. Following the shocking discovery, Aiden was immediately arrested as a suspect, and brought in for more questioning. Naturally, Aiden's parents demanded that he was allowed an attorney before speaking, and they told Aiden not to speak to any officers until they arrived. And although this makes legal sense, the next moves were… rather stupid. After arriving at the police station, Aiden's parents attended the same room that Aiden was being held in, and unbeknownst to them at the time, that room was being audio recorded, therefore picking up everything that was being said. She told Aiden that Tristan was found in the neighbourhood, to which he asked his mother if she was good. Crystal replied with, no, she's dead, it's all on you right now. And Aiden responded, how is it my problem? Crystal asked Aiden where Tristan went after he left her, Aiden stating that she probably kept walking. But Jason stopped the two carrying on in their conversation, saying, we probably shouldn't be talking here. This is where the conversation becomes more suspicious. Referring to the clothes that Aiden was wearing that night, Jason asked his son if anything would be found on them. In which Aiden replied with, no sir. Shortly after this, Crystal then asked Aiden if he wore khakis or blue jeans. Aiden replied to say he wore blue jeans, in which Crystal asked again if Aiden was sure there was nothing on them. He replied with, I don't think so, why? Crystal then gave Aiden a questioning look, and whispered, blood. She tried to reassure Aiden with an alternative story, saying, When we looked on the camera, you were wearing khakis, right? In which Aiden then indicated, yes. Police officers were likely stunned as they watched this scenario unfold. They had already obtained and partially reviewed the Fuji household surveillance tapes, and what they eventually saw was Crystal washing a pair of blue jeans in the sink earlier that day. And upon retrieval of those jeans, they and the sink they were washed in both tested positive for blood. At the end of their conversation, Aiden's parents didn't advise him to tell the truth, but instead advised him to choose a story and stick with it. Following the surveillance footage, Aiden's twisted story, and the evidence collected back at the Fuji household, Aiden was officially arrested and charged for second degree murder, which eventually was changed to a charge of first degree murder. So let me tell you what you are charged with. You have been indicted by the St. John's County Grand Jury on the charge of first degree premeditated murder. That is a capital felony that is normally uh, punishable by up to death or life imprisonment. In your case, because you are not yet 18 years old, death is not a possible sentence pursuant to the Florida and United States Supreme Courts, but this charge does carry a maximum penalty of life imprisonment. Do you understand the charge against you? Yes, sir. All right, there is probable cause to detain you on this charge uh, pursuant to the indictment issued by the uh, St. John's County Grand Jury yesterday. It turns out that Aiden was well known amongst his friends for joking about one day murdering someone, and he often told people that he would eventually be in jail for something big. At the time of his arrest, Aiden's girlfriend, who remains unnamed, told officers how Aiden often described about murdering someone by dragging their bodies into the woods before stabbing them. 
And to add to these harrowing claims, she also described how Aidan often snuck up behind her with a knife before pretending to cut her throat. Tragically, this proves that Aidan often expressed his violent nature to family and friends. All the same, no attempts were ever made to quell these thoughts. Aidan evidently had violent fantasies, and according to his girlfriend, he apparently heard voices in his head too. All of which were angry, told him to harm people, and told him he was worthless. The conclusion to this case seems relatively straightforward. Upon a thorough search of Aidan's home, police found multiple items of clothing which contained blood on them, as well as bloody sneakers, a collection of eight knives, and a shank that Aidan had made himself. The teen's room was littered with papers and workbooks from school, and within those books were drawings of satanic imagery. This included sketches of acts of violence and gore, specifically against women. Those around Aidan described him as extremely unfeeling and unbothered by the world around him. He didn't seem to care about himself, or anything else for that matter. All of these traits add up to a very disturbing and dangerous individual, and these violent fantasies and lack of empathy may be the key factors which spurred Aidan Fucci to murder Tristan Bailey. In addition to Aidan's arrest, his mother, Crystal Smith, was also arrested under suspicion of tampering with evidence, which obviously is due to her washing his bloody clothes and instructing him in the interview room. Throughout initial court proceedings, Aidan was initially uncaring and unbothered about his circumstances. But after he had been detained, his demeanour had drastically changed. Naturally, he exploited his mental health to indicate psychiatric defence, which resulted in scenes like the following, where Aidan talks to demons or voices in his head. I don't want you demons. I want you demons to take my soul. You demons want to take my soul away. I don't know you didn't steal my soul. I don't know what's going on. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? Why, why am I here? I just want to talk to my mom and dad. What's going on? What's going on? What's going on? It is yet to be seen if the judge and jury believe Aiden's claims of demons, as he has not yet stood trial. But these sorts of stunts rarely succeed, especially if you're a bad actor. Psychologically speaking, we don't know yet what psychologists have concluded about Aiden, but I'm sure this will eventually come to light. Aiden Fucci is currently awaiting trial in Jacksonville, which is scheduled for late 2022, and although a minor, he will be tried as an adult without the death penalty. And although Aiden is currently considered innocent until proven guilty, it's safe to say that with all the concerning evidence behind him, Aiden has a very difficult road ahead. And sadly, this case was both unnecessary and entirely avoidable. Although we don't quite know all of the details behind this case yet, it resulted in the loss of a young girl at the very beginning of her life. Tristan Bailey was a daughter, sister, friend, and teammate. In her young teenage years, she was going through a rebellious streak, which many of us undergo. It is very difficult for a parent to give their children ample supervision, while also respecting their own privacy and independence and I'm sure that Tristan had no idea that sneaking out would result in her death. Because rightfully so, more than 99% of the time, nothing would happen. This was an extremely unprovoked and illogical scenario, caused by, allegedly, an extremely disturbing boy. We will see where Aiden's trial takes him, and of course I'll keep all of you up to date with any current news on this case. You can find case updates in my pinned comment down below, or feel free to follow me on Instagram if you have one. I often post case updates, host giveaways, and share extra case information over there. And that brings us to the end of today's case, folks, for now. Thank you so much for watching another video today by Coffeehouse Crime. If you found this case interesting or learned something new today, then please remember to like the video and subscribe if you haven't yet. What are your thoughts on Tristan's case? Do you think Aiden Fucci is guilty? And what do you think the outcome will be? Please share your thoughts in the comments down below. I'll be back again real soon for another video. But until that moment arrives, look after each other. Goodbye.